presentation is titled Analyzing Visual Rhetoric, an Interactive Workshop. And our fearless workshop leader in this experimental interactive session will be Jack Selzer. Jack has taught a variety of composition and technical communication courses at Penn State, where he's taught since 1978. He's collaborated with colleagues there and elsewhere in all kinds of ways. With, with Lester Fagley, he has written Good Reasons and Good Reasons with Contemporary Arguments, now in their fifth edition. And he has also edited a number of versions of Conversations, Readings for Writing, now edited by Dominic Deli Carpini. Past president of the Rhetoric Society of America, previously president of the Association of Teachers of Technical Writing, and current director of Penn State's Paterno Fellows Program. Jack has published or edited a number of articles and books, including Rhetorical Bodies with Sharon Crowley, Kenneth Burke in the 1930s with Ann George, and Kenneth Burke in Greenwich Village. He currently enjoys teaching a first-year seminar on the rhetoric of the civil rights movement. And he happens to be a charter member of the longest continuously running fantasy sports league on the face of the earth. This workshop intends to suggest some ways in which we can help our students to better understand the visual arguments that surround us all every day and facilitate an awareness in them that will make them more critical consumers of the photographs, websites, posters, advertisements, and other visual arguments that are so prevalent in our society. Jack will demonstrate a practical approach to the rhetorical analysis of visual rhetoric, taking us all through the process of analyzing together a controversial and challenging visual argument and facilitating a discussion meant to simulate a classroom discussion in the hopes that we'll leave this session with a tested, practical sense of what is involved in teaching visual rhetoric and the analysis of visual rhetoric successfully. You can use the questions box on your screen to participate in the discussion. Or you can click raise your hand if you want to be unmuted so you can speak your piece. This is our first session in this interactive format. So uh, please be patient if we can't get to you um, right away. And, but uh, please do feel free to um, engage um, with, with Jack through the questions um, dialog box. So Jack, I'm turning this show over to you. Are you ready to get started? You worried me a little bit when you used that term experimental. <laughs> but you had but um, I think I'm I looking think forward to great. seeing how this goes. I have my trusty assistant here, Jimmy Hughes. He's going to make sure that we don't have any problems on this end. And I sure appreciate all of your help in setting this up. Oh, no problem. What we're going to do uh, together, everybody, is uh, discuss rhetorical analysis and specifically the rhetorical analysis of visual rhetoric. Always a lively topic. And as Amy indicated, we're going to try to do an interactive webinar this morning. We'll see how it goes. Uh, the point is, though, that this all depends really on your participation, everybody, not just your being in the audience today. So if you don't participate, this is going to really fall flat. I'm kind of thinking of this as sort of a classroom in which we're all here together to carry on a workshop on visual rhetoric, one that's designed to teach you how to do rhetorical analysis better, and of course, how to teach it better. So first, I'm going to show everybody something. And then I'm going to ask everybody to interpret it and write about it. And then we'll share everybody's responses, kind of talk about it together. And then we'll have a general question and answer session at the end. So that's my forecast here. I'm going to show you something, ask you to do something about it, and then we'll talk about your responses. So I guess we're ready to begin. Here is a photo of the swimmer Jenny Thompson. You can see that she's standing on a beach. Her hands are hiding her breath. She's topless. This photo appeared, as you can see at the very bottom, in the September 4, 2000 issue of Sports Illustrated. And I want to draw your attention. You see my uh, pointer there? At the bottom, you have one of the readers makes a comment on it. As a veteran of the U.S. Coast Guard, I have never before been so moved by the sight of the stars and stripes. Long may she wave, says Scott Grantham. 
So I think Scott is uh, interpreting this as uh, as if it were a photo in a girly magazine. But other people up here don't quite see it that way. Uh, under the heading Provocative Pros, Kim Bayer from Oklahoma says, hey, leave the toplessness in your swimsuit issue where the bimbos belong and put Jenny Thompson in the same place of respect that you put other top athletes. And then the second uh, letter is along the same lines. After seeing the pose of Thompson, I turned every page of your magazine. Funny, the male athletes were fully clothed. Not one had his pants off with his hands covering his anatomy. And then the third one uh, says, with the suit Thompson's wearing, the U.S. team should sweep the gold. However, those boots may call, cause some drag in the water. They weren't the only ones interested in this photograph. Rick Riley, who uh, always did a end of the magazine essay, also weighed in on this photo. I want to call your attention here to this part of his. I'm reading right here. Why do some women have their, their girdles all in a wad about this photo? Why is a women's sports foundation so upset? Why did former WSF president Donna De Verona say of Thompson and other women athletes who pose nude, I want them to keep their clothes on? Why did USA Today columnist Christine Brennan go all Aunt B, complaining that the Thompson picture sends girls the insecure message that an old stereotype still lives and thrives? If you doubt this, look at the picture and notice where your eye goes first, right to her chest. What a load of hypocrites. When Dennis Rodman posed nude on a motorcycle, I don't recall Brennan complaining. Lance Armstrong, Dan O'Brien, Ricky Williams, they've all posed nude. I don't remember De Verona rushing around trying to get them to put on a towel. Uh, and so on. And at the very end, he kind of sums it up with a kind of statement of thesis right here. Thompson is sending young girls a terrific message. Fit is sexy. Muscles are sexy. Sport is sexy. Give it a try. So which is it, everybody? Is it a piece of cheesecake that reinforces stereotypes about women? Is it something that depicts women as, as bimbo? Or is Jenny Thompson expressing her freedom in participating in this photo? Does the photo make an argument in keeping with the goals of feminism? Is it a celebration of women's liberation? Or is it an exploitation of women? So which is it, everybody? Now, for five minutes, I want you to all answer that question. Is it cheap cheesecake or a liberatory statement? I want you to examine the photo, come to a conclusion about what argument that photo makes, and then give your reasons. And then write that into the question section in the box on your screen. So use that questions box. Nobody will see what you've said until all the responses are in. And after five minutes, I'll come back to you, and we'll all discuss what everybody thinks about this photo. OK, everybody? Go. Boy, Amy, my class is awfully quiet today. They're working so diligently. That's right. <laughs> if they were unmuted, you could hear them furiously typing, I think. Hmm. 
they're probably not typing yet. They're probably gathering their thoughts. Perhaps. We still have about two or three minutes, everybody, maybe two and a half minutes. I'm really looking forward to seeing what you think this photo argues and why. Does this photo exploit women? Or does it make a liberatory statement? And why? Why do you think so? Take one more minute, everybody, to get your answers and your evidence logged in. The drama is building here. I'm going to see if anybody is actually participating in this thing. <laughs> I'm sure you are. But we're hiding all the, res all the responses until everybody's had a chance. Okay, Amy, can you show us what we've got here? Let's see. Um, Jean-Pierre, how, um, how do you want to do that? Uh, Jack, would you like them read back to you, or would you like to see them yourself? Either way, you can read them back. What's the first person say? Uh, let's see. opening the... I have, um, let me see, Alan Williams, I believe, uh, 
saying that it's both the meaning of the photograph is largely determined by the observer. Even though there are signifiers of sex, freedom, and femininity here, the overall context of those signifiers, in other words, the signified, is determined by the reader of the visual text. If the reader is offended, so be it. If the reader sees positive images of fitness, freedom, and empowerment, that's an equally valid response. Okay, that's a great beginning. Is there any, uh, that's what I would call a kind of thesis statement and in interpretation. Uh, does he suggest any particulars, draw our attention to any particulars? I guess maybe he doesn't because he's really saying it's in the eyes of the beholder. Right, uh, I didn't the see that. Um, the next one. Hey, you know what, John Pierre? Maybe um, we could, maybe you could uh, take the, take control of the screen again and and blow up the question box and we could um, show that there are a lot of responses that might be um, easier to kind of go through it. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Try that. Okay, I will make myself presenter. All right, Jack, you should be able to see them now. Hmm. We're just, I think we're just seeing blue sky there. I think we're seeing yeah. the uh, screen. Uh, yes, that could be because it doesn't show the GoToWebinar software. Uh, um, yeah. Give me one read, second. Oh man, uh, just read them off there. Okay. Um, we have another response saying that uh, because the woman herself is posing this way, I would not call it exploitation. Um, okay, so, attention to the pose itself. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. Exactly. Uh, I have. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I'm saying. What's the next comment? The next comment is, no one forced Thompson to pose this way. She obviously didn't feel exploited, or she would have refused. Her intentions are important here. Okay, very good. Um, I have another response saying, uh, well, why couldn't it be both? She seems to be proudly displaying powerful muscles and to be unashamed of her sexuality slash gender slash physical embodiment, which is a liberatory statement, um, which could be a statement of power or it could be seen as a woman who's trying to be masculine in her expression of power. Not exactly exploitative, but certainly not purely liberatory. If anything, mm -hmm. it's probably not something very empowering to women if being muscular and athletic is the standard for fit and sexy. What about curvy? So I'd say it could probably be seen as both an expression of feminine empowerment and as something exploitative, depending on definitions of fit, sexy, liberation, and exploitation. Okay, yeah, somebody taking a middle position on the thesis and calling our attention to uh, the features, the, the muscles in the photo. Right, What's exactly. The next? Uh, the next one is uh, to say it's cheesecake. No need to pose topless, sends the wrong message. Athletes need mental strength and determination. This photo does nothing to show her strength or capabilities as an athlete. So it calls attention to the, her toplessness. Mm -hmm. What next comment? Mm -hmm. Next one is, uh, <clears throat> it's somebody else, they say, I see it both ways. It is feminism in one way because it shows how liberated she feels to be able to pose that way and feel proud about her body that she took great effort to attain as an athlete. This feeling shows through her face in the picture, but at the same time, this photo is in Sports Illustrated, which is well known for exploiting women with these types of pictures in their swimsuit issue. If the picture were in some more serious magazine instead of Sports Illustrated, then the picture would have a better chance of being seen as feminism. Mm -hmm. So it calls attention to her physical features and then calls attention to its presence in Sports Illustrated. Correct. So I'm going to yep. be interested to see if other people comment on the Sports Illustrated context. Mm -hmm. So keep wheeling these out. Uh, sure. Uh, next person, they say they're undecided in our room. I guess there's a, uh, a few of them um, in a classroom or something. They considered context and uh, the time. It was, after all, 13 years ago. Um, and the pose, strong, not provocative, like the Superman pose. Yeah, Superman, huh? Mm-hmm. That, okay, what's uh, next? next uh, the next, is, uh, they say, sexism, pure and simple. Um, I think the editor is lying to himself if he thinks anything different. I don't know why 
or if anyone would comment about Dennis Rodman, but clearly the feminist groups comment about feminist issues. That's what they do. Why ask why about these folks either? So definitely makes a statement that they think it's a sexist comment, mm -hmm. but they don't really uh, give any details in the photo. Let's see if some other people sympathize with that and give some reasons for that. Go ahead. Okay. Keep on wheeling these out. Sure. Uh, next one, they say, uh, yes, it is provocative and nothing I would choose to do, but I believe she shows she's showing liberation. Next. I find the appeals to be too easy. I see them as attempts to get readers, which makes me feel like they are not sincere. Good. Next. Um, uh, this person, uh, they don't think, uh, they think that this doesn't objectify women because it treats them the same way as men, regardless of their sex or gender. Mm -hmm. Next. Um, let me see. I think that's it for now. Um, we may have to wait a couple minutes if, uh, you know, for people to comment on these. Anybody now want to make another comment? Do you want to respond to the people who've already, do you disagree with what you've heard? Is there anything that you want to add? And I'd like to hear people talk about, uh, Jean-Pierre, can we have the photo back? Yes, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll make you a presenter again, and you can just bring up the photo. Okay. Okay. Okay, everybody. I want to, I want to hear more details here. Uh, why is she on the beach? Why is she wearing that kind of a bathing suit? What do you make of those boots? Do you want to say anything more about Sports Illustrated and the particular moment in which this, uh, uh, this photograph appeared? And as other comments come in, um, Jean-Pierre, if you mm -hmm. can just read them as they come. Okay, we'll do. Uh, uh, here we go. I have a, another one. Uh, the fact that we even try to analyze this shows how uncomfortable Americans are with sexuality in general. Good. So, look, uh, just because there's sexuality involved doesn't make it sexist. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, somebody else brought up the point that um, with the title Old Glory, for me it draws attention to the Stars and Stripes, uh, and so to them it's more of a patriotic picture. Yeah, and then how would that fit into whether or not it's sexist or liberatory? Mm. I guess if it's glory, that would fall into the, um, I, I'm expecting the person's going to say, well, that makes it part of our national ideology of freedom. So the suit makes it more liberatory than another kind of suit, let's say. Next comment. Are they still okay. coming in? Uh, I'm waiting on some more now. Um, let's see. I want to see somebody try to explain those boots as a liberatory gesture. <laughs> What is she wearing those boots for on a on a beach? <laughs> That's what a good point. What the heck is she doing on a beach anyway? Mm, uh, okay, I have somebody else here. Uh, the photo is meant to be empowering. The pose is very evocative of the Wonder Woman fantasy. Looking from the bottom up, you see the red boots, which are straight from the comic book legend. Secondly, the shorts are reminiscent of Wonder Woman's trademark outfit. Finally, looking at the top, the pose is, is the antithesis of the Wonder Woman pose. The heroine would often pose with their hands on her hips. Was Wonder Woman herself any less sexualized fighting crime in a bikini? Oh, that's interesting. That's a great observation about, in the connection with somebody mentioned Superman earlier. Mm -hmm. And now we're seeing exactly. Wonder Woman in particular. And the, uh, on the one hand, a imitation of her costume. On the other hand, kind of a mockery of it when she takes off her top. Mm -hmm. um, there's somebody else. They say, context matters, but I find her facial expressions intriguing. She's smiling and seems proud. Her stance also underscores this. I think, again, you could read this either way. If you think it's exploitative, you could say that she's buying into the notion that women's liberation power has to be on other people's terms. If you think it's deliberatory, you could say that this smile is proof that she's owning the expression. Yeah, that gaze is interesting. Yeah, she's mm. looking right back at that camera, mm -hmm. and a particular contributor 
interpret it as I'm proud of myself, uh, I'm free, liberated, here's who I am. Does everybody else see the gays in the same way? Um, let's see. I actually have another comment. I'm not sure if it speaks directly oh, to the gays. Oh, okay. uh, people who think the pose is definitely purposeful haven't been on a photo shoot. The photographer is shooting a mile a minute, and she's moving quickly. I wouldn't be surprised if she didn't even remember taking that specific shot. She might have been asked to change into another suit and just turn around for a second. This happens, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's... Uh... Yeah, that, that brings in issues about construction into mm. the interpretation of mm -hmm. the photo. That's good. Um, she is on a beach because it is typical of Sports Illustrated, but the boots make her more masculine or showing her power. Okay, so the boots would be empowering in, uh, in the Wonder Woman scheme. Mm -hmm. And also it makes them more masculine, uh, this person said. Yeah. Okay, good. Next. Um, just waiting. Hey, everybody. What does it matter that this shows up in Sports Illustrated? Does it make any difference that it's in Sports Illustrated as opposed to any other kind of magazine? We've already had one comment along this, but I want to push you to develop that. Uh, let's see, we have, uh, yes, in addition, look at the way of the hands are fisted and not splayed. It also reminds me of that beating of the chest ritual present in primates. Oh, interesting, yeah, beating of the, pe of the, of the chest, yeah, that's mm -hmm. a nice observation. She's beating her chest, so to speak, as opposed to um, showing off her breasts. Right. Yeah. Um... <laughs> uh, somebody else mentioned also that uh, if you're looking at it from the bottom up, uh, the beach into the boots is there's very limited light until you get to the shorts and chest, which is uh, magnified with the light drawing your attention uh, to the upper body and to the shorts, uh, which makes it seem that it's exploited because your focus is on the chest first. Yeah, exactly. The lighting seems to call attention to key parts of her anatomy, let's put it that way. Right, right. You know, I'm just going to uh, say a few things about the Sports Illustrated framework. From When I've used this in my own classes, uh, sometimes we'll get into an argument about whether or not Sports Illustrated is a, quote, men's magazine or not. Uh, some people will say, well, Hey, it's a, it's a sports magazine. It's not a men's magazine. And some of my other students will say, are you kidding? Uh, and they'll draw statistics about how 85% of the subscribers to Sports Illustrated are men. And they um, comment about the annual swimsuit issue in which, uh, you know, it's ba basically bordering on softcore porn, some of these students would contend, uh, and making her intertextual with that swimsuit issue, which is obviously, you know, exploitative and sexist. I would also mention that sometimes the students will bring up, uh, just as the participants here have mentioned Wonder Woman and Superman as prototypes, they will mention uh, art, artworks. Uh, in the history of art, I, I've had students who are art students who would say something like, well, that, that uh, gaze of Jenny Thompson is very naughty. In the history of art, they say, if a nude or semi-nude woman is kind of caught off guard, that's one thing. But if the subject gazes back at the painter, that's considered very naughty. Uh, anyway, um, does anybody have anything else that they want to add or disagree with before we talk a little bit more about what this all adds up to? Are you, are you getting any more um, observations? Um, I'm not, not as of yet, so I guess we may as well just keep going for now. Okay. Well, this, this, is, this is sort of, uh, I'll 
you, you all are getting the point. And the point is that in the interpretation of an argument like this, there's a couple of things you can do. You can draw attention to the object itself, what I call textual analysis. You can consider the text as bordered and just draw attention to details within the item under scrutiny. In this case, the beating of the chest, her pose, her face, those muscles, the bathing suit, the beach, the boots, the light, her toplessness. All of those were things that people cited either to support that it was a liberatory statement or that it was sexist. So you can always look at the item itself and do a, what I would call a close analysis. Or you can look at the context and see how that affects your interpretation. In this case, the comments about Sports Illustrated were contextual. This photo might mean something different. If It would make a different argument in a different magazine. And that's where that Rick, Rick Riley says, you know, what about these other magazines? Um, so the fact that it's a Sports Illustrated item makes a big difference. Other people also went outside the text. They talked about Superman. They talked about Wonder Woman. Other people talked about Thompson's intent in doing this. Or they talked about you know, the conditions under which the argument was, pre was, was uh, created. They went out to, outside the text in that way. And then I brought in the extra textual issue of the um, history of art and whether or not her gaze is naughty because it's intertextual with other um, items in the history of art. So I, I think everybody is getting the point that in it, you basically make an interpretation and support it by comments about the text and comments about the context. Everybody's thinking of discourses as arguments, first of all. And then they're thinking of arguments not as self-contained, not just as self-contained, but part of a chain of discourses. This Jenny Thompson photo doesn't stand on a pedestal separate from culture, separate from other discourses. It's part of a network of discourses part of an ongoing conversation, so to speak. So it's not just that photo. It's a photo within a network of discourses that include these letters to the editor, this piece by Rick Riley, Sports Illustrated in general, the Sports Illustrated swimsuit issue, the history of art, and Wonder Woman and Superman. That's the large your network of discourses that help us to interpret. So kind of the point of this is to make rhetorical analysis reflect that. When you do rhetorical analysis, make sure you attend to textual features, but also to context. Don't just look at the photo or the essay or the argument, the written argument or the photograph or whatever. Look at both text and context. So this is kind of where we are, in other words, in this last slide. A, a photograph is an argument. In rhetorical analysis, think of the item under scrutiny as an argument. Anything that has a design on readers' values, beliefs, and actions. And then once you think of it as an argument, do textual analysis, attend to features within the text, ignore history and culture, assume that the thing is kind of outside of time, outside of culture. It's kind of on a pedestal, as if it were a museum piece. But also consider the, the context. 
how is this argument a contribution to a continuing conversation? And of course, sometimes that requires a good bit of uh, research. You've got to go back and find out what other discourses were in the air uh, when the item you know, was created. Just as people here mentioned things like Wonder Woman and Superman and other things that were in action in the year 2000 when this particular essay was, uh, was or this particular photograph was mounted. Now, I, I happen, I'm, I'm impressed with everybody's conclusion about this, that actually the Jenny Thompson photo is ambiguous. I was pushing you to take a position on one side or the other that to, to argue that it was either sexist or liberatory. But I was impressed that most people saw it as conflicted, a conflicted argument. I would say it doesn't really make a coherent argument. And if I were writing about it, the sort of interpretations that everybody else was offering are ones that I would have taken as my own thesis. I would be arguing that this, may, this is an ambiguous piece, it makes a conflicted argument, and I would draw my evidence either from the text, close analysis of the item itself, or from the contextual points that people were bringing up. But in any case, if I were writing about it, I'd be talking both about text and context. So now, now let's see if there's any other questions coming up about rhetorical analysis more generally or about this whole episode. Uh, everybody out there, do you have additional questions about rhetorical analysis in general, the rhetorical analysis of visual culture in particular, or anything else that's come up this morning? I think we still have about seven or eight minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, Jack, while we wait for that, I had a question. I was wondering um, what kind of um, what kind of assignment does this um, lead into? Do you do they write an essay or do they create a visual argument of their own in response to this, or where do they go from from the analysis? Well, I like your your suggestion that they develop <laughs> their own argument, but you know. In my courses, rhetorical analysis is really fundamental to what we're trying to do. You know, reading and writing go together. So I usually make a formal rhetorical analysis assignment where they would pick an item uh, to explain, basically. Mm -hmm. They would pick either an essay or an op-ed piece. A lot of them will pick ads because they will have a visual dimension. Uh, but they can pick photographs, uh, they can pick artworks. So I, I usually pick something that has designs on an audience and ask them to explain what the argument is and more, more especially how it makes its argument. So I, I would say it picks up, you know, it, it, it's part of the rhetorical analysis that so many people are uh, assigning to their classes these days. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that reminds me of your um, that the great presentation you did uh, on this conference a year or so ago. I think um, the one about the rhetorical analysis of Martin Luther King's uh, the photograph and the famous photograph from the "I Have a Dream" speech. And the um, but this is, I guess, this is really fundamental to um, to your teaching. This idea of um, the close rhetorical analysis and of these different cultural artifacts. It's so interesting. Yes, thanks. That's one of my uh, favorite set pieces. We take the I Have a Dream speech, and especially the ending that is so frequently put on TV and that mm -hmm. has become so canonical. And then uh, we not only do a close analysis of the textual features there, but also situate it first within the entire day of August 28, 1963. Mm -hmm. And then, more broadly, in the whole summer of 1963. So again, it's this text plus context that shows up all of the details that uh, went into King's speech. So the result of rhetorical analysis, of course, is a greater appreciation and understanding of the item under scrutiny. Mm -hmm. As awkward as it is to have this kind of webinar uh, format, 
I was really impressed with how everybody was able to, uh, you know, do a vital rhetorical analysis that ended up teaching us a lot about that Jenny Thompson photo. Mm -hmm. At the beginning, you know, we had our druthers, but by working together, we all learned something about that uh, about that photograph that we hadn't thought of before, and that's really the goal of rhetorical analysis to mm -hmm. show up you know, to help us to understand better the item that's under scrutiny. And uh, any a real, sort of a related question um, from Susan mm -hmm. Brooks is, she's wondering, um, so how do we know when we have uh, enough information to make a quote-unquote good contextual analysis? Who decides? Yeah, that's great. Where, where do you stop with this contextual analysis? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Well, I would say that for practical purposes, you're going to be writing a paper about this. So from my point of view, you do enough contextual analysis until you're learning enough to have something to teach. So when I, in my own rhetorical analysis, I start doing a, a study of the original circumstances, and I try to turn up the discourses that, that are in the air. But when I start finding great stuff, when I really can see the other discourses that uh, the origin, you know, that, that the argument is a, a addressing or attending to. When I really start, when it starts being productive, then I feel like, okay, I have something to teach here. I can stop. But she, what was her name again, Susan? Susan, Susan Moore? Yeah, Susan that was Brooks. an excellent observation. The contextual analysis can go on and on and on because these networks of discourses go on and on and on. Um, yeah, so, but you've got to stop someplace. And for me, I stop once I have something to teach, something that I think is going to really open up the text for some other reader. I've got some news value. Well, that, I think um, we're, we're just about out of time, and we're out of questions. So, um, But I, I think the interactive workshop approach went really well. I really appreciate you, um, you know, breathing that new, uh, that kind of, this kind of new format. And, and